What's going on, everybody? What's up? What's up? I see we are live. I see we already have some people who are hopping on. Thank you so much to Facebook. And also, thank you so much to YouTube. That's where you can find us. You see, I'm not by myself. I know y'all been waiting for this as long as I, uh, since I posted it. But just in case we have never met before, I want to introduce myself. My name is Demita McGee. Y'all, I'm a Christian women's business coach. I'm an author. I'm a speaker. And what I do, I own a company called Christian Academy, Christian Business Academy Worldwide. And what we do is we help people operate their businesses using biblical principles. And we help with um, spiritual success strategies for financial abundance. And today we're going to get into some real financial abundance type talk. What's up, Edwin? I see you. And thank you for tagging, you know, some family and friends. So before we get started, before I introduce this beautiful woman who is either on my right or left, depending upon how it shows up on your screen. I want you to know what we are here for. Y'all, we're going to have a serious conversation about banking. I know you saw that description somewhere above or below this video. And that description specifically says a couple of things that I know people are struggling with. And it's banking in general. It's money. It's finances. I see y'all popping in. What's up, Sheridan? Tanisha, I see you. Hey, Sakina. I love it. I love it. What's up, everybody? So what I want you guys to do is I want you to tag somebody right now, one of your good friends, that you feel like, one, they need to know this because you guys, what we're about to unleash on you over the next 30 minutes or so, you are going to wish that they were on here so they could ask their questions live. We're not just going to talk at you tonight. Tonight, we're going to have a conversation. A conversation is dialogue. But guess what? Not just dialogue between me and this beautiful guest, dialogue between me, her, and you. So if you have questions, I want you to put them in the chat and then we will answer them. So without further ado, let's dig into the purpose of tonight. Tonight is all about, we have, we, 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 we use banking. We get a direct deposit. It goes into a bank. But you guys, what I did not realize, I know I struggle at one point with overdraft fees. You guys, I paid an overdraft fee of $25 for, it's so crazy, $27 for a $25 bill. So I basically paid over $50 for a bill because I had to pay the bank and pay the bill. I know I'm not the only one that had that challenge. But this is the thing that's crazy. There are people that are stuck in this cycle and you don't know that it's a cycle. So what I'm going to do is bring up our guest. I want her to introduce herself to you, but let me just do the honest first. I'm so grateful to be able to share this stage with her. You know how sometimes you pray for the right connections. You pray for people in your network that make you better, but not just make you better. They come with a host of information that can even help your network. That's what this woman and who she is to me. We're not even in the same place. She's a beautiful Dominican American. Y'all see it already. Hailing from New York, but she's transplanted right now in Indianapolis. She is a leader among leaders. Y'all, she is a banking professional turned crypto enthusiast. And what we want to talk about tonight is the experience that she has that's going to give us the dark side of the banking industry. Because what you didn't know is it's not just you struggling. And what you didn't also, what you also didn't know is it wasn't by accident. So y'all give it up in that chat. Welcome my friend, this amazing woman, the one and only Francis Rodriguez. What's up love? How are you? Hey. Okay. So okay. Can so can you guys hear me? Hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Listen, y'all, give it up for Demita. She said something, she said something so, powerful. so powerful. Sometimes, Sometimes we're praying, praying for, for a, a, a connection. connection. And man, and man when God delivers, he's more than timely. <laughs> so really, so the, really honor the honor is mine. Is mine. Is mine. Um, like to be the said, I am a previous, previous banker turned, turned crypto enthusiast. Um, really, all the things, the things that revolve around money in the right way, enthusiast. Because, because today, today we just want to keep it real. Yep. I love how it's best can we keep it hot, honest, transparent. Because, because the, thing the thing is, is I'm just I'm like you on the other, on the other side, side of this conversation. conversation. I'm, a I'm a mom. My littles are two and seven. seven. And I was, I was taught, taught a lot of the things that the average person was talking about. So today, I just want to mystify some of that. Maybe just even make you more curious. Because, because I know, I know I'm, not I'm not the only person that has ever wondered, hey, is the bank allowed to do that? Sometimes, Sometimes they're not. They're not. <laughs> and so, and so we want to talk about the kind of things tonight. So, Ricky, let me just say, this is a dialogue. 
We want this, we want this to be a conversation. If you guys, if you guys have, have questions, questions, drop them below. And more, and more importantly, understand that, that you cannot listen, um, um, take, take in, in try, to try to digest this conversation, conversation in shame, in shame embarrassment, and guilt. guilt. Because see, the thing is, I was always taught you can, you can only see as far as the roof on their, their hat. So it, so it may appear that, that people around, around you might be more savvy with money, money and understand, understand banking, and maybe, and maybe you feel like you don't. I can, I can guarantee you, you there, there are more, more people around you that may be the same way you feel. So, Demita, I'm going to yes. let you take over. We're going to start this conversation however you want it to, and let's keep it honest. Good stuff. Your sound is cutting in and out. Is it? It is. Like it's doing something weird. I don't really know how to explain it. Okay. okay but it's so doing it. Let's, let's do this. Yeah, something like that. Yes. Let's like go, they go. just asked me, is there an echo? And I'm getting text messages and everything. Yeah, it sounds weird. Okay. Okay. Yes. Hold on, y'all. We're going to fix the sound because this is really good information. I'm telling you, I was blown away when we started, when I started learning this. Okay. I, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. So let's see if we can get this sound fixed for y'all. Okay. Say something for us, sis. Okay. Is okay. This is this better? Oh my God. Yes. Let's work. Let's oh. work. That's it. Let's go. Okay. Thank y'all so much. I appreciate you in the chat for letting us know. I appreciate the text messages and now we got it fixed. We're about to work. So this is where I want to start. Um, we did something called a 21 day financial fast. And in that book, which I usually have on my desk, but I think I officially put it up because we've done it about four or five times. One of the things that comes up in that book is there is a section on savings. There's a section on just banking in general, how to use different accounts, different things like that. And this is the challenge when we had Frances come and share her expertise, man, listen, I was blown away. So I want to start at the beginning. I want to start with the fact that a lot of you guys right now, you think that in, in the ground rules, no shame, no humiliation, be 100% open, it's 100% all good. We are here to learn tonight because see what happens oftentimes is we say things like we can't talk about money, that's rude. You know why we call it rude? Because we don't have any. And so you don't want to tell nobody you're struggling and that's been passed down from generation to generation and you believe it. But tonight we break all of that. Tonight we're going to start having transparent conversations so we can help some people and help ourselves because I know what's happened for me over the last year and a half. So let's start at the beginning. I want you to share Share with us when it comes to like just traditional banking, what are some of the practices that people are, they're predatory practices, but some people don't even realize they're being preyed upon. Ooh, let's go let's just, again. Let's just go straight there. Okay. Okay. So, so let, let's, let's see, see if I'm still echoing. echoing. You sound great. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Perfect. perfect. So, so, man, that's, man, a, that's a heavy question. question. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Let's start, Let's start here. here. I know, I know a lot of people, lot of people are, are looking around, around at the money world, world right now, kind of kind of wondering, wondering like, like, is this something, something I should trust? Wait a minute. Somebody says you are still echoing. You sound great for me. Do me a favor in the chat. Are you guys? Is she still echoing for you? It says there is still an echo. That's so weird. You sound wonderful to me. I wonder. I wonder what if your mic gets muted, Jamita. Try now. Okay. okay. Am I still I'm echoing? Am I echoing, you guys? Let us know in the chat with a one if I am good or a two if I'm echoing. So yes, still echoing or yes, it's better? I will mute myself when she talks. There we go. Okay, that might be it. Okay, well, May said echo. There's you a good. bit of a delay. We're better. There's a bit of a delay. So what happened okay. was we had to adjust for the delay. So I'm going to mute myself. That's why I can't hear it. All right, go ahead. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so we'll go with that. And when Demita comes up, I'll go on mute so that we're good. All right, you guys. So honestly, this uh, is one of my favorite questions because I know sometimes we look around at what's happening with our money world right now. And I'm a mom for real, y'all. That is my two-year-old in the background. So you may hear her. But I, I know that we might look around right now and see all this new stuff when it comes to money and we feel a little taken back. We kind of feel like, oh, is that something I can trust? But I just want to start with this. When it comes to traditional banking is 
we put so much trust in our traditional banks and we have from the beginning of time because that's essentially what you were just always taught to do. And so you don't know anything different. A part of you might might kind of be hesitant, but for the most part, you're taught to put your soul trust in banking, you guys. But the craziest thing is we never once stop to ask ourselves, how does this really work? But we just go with the flow. And that's the most dangerous space to be in. And I say it because that used to be me, right? And, and it still even was me when I first was working in my career in, at the banks because they teach us to know money the way they need us to know money. And so let's talk about what they do with the money, if that's cool with y'all. Because see, the primary thing, yes, we can argue that you know banks were created to to be convenient or whatever they want to say banks were created for. But understand that overall, and you can research all of this overall, banks were created for lending purposes. And I won't give y'all a whole lot on that because I want you guys to come back Wednesday. Some powerful conversation is going to be happening on the lending aspect, but I'm going to touch on it a little bit because it is the most important piece because what we don't understand is, Banks were created to lend money, right? Whether that's to lend money to us as an individual, right? The consumer, maybe it's to lend it to a business or some kind of other entity, but essentially they were still put together to lend. And so maybe you're wondering, okay, well, where's this money coming from that they're going to be lending to people? Y'all, it's coming from you. It's coming from me. It's coming from Demita. It's coming from who's in that chat? Brandon, Jennifer. It's coming from all of us because when they lend, it is from a pooled deposit of money. And the craziest thing is, as I get more into this conversation and Demita, feel free to stop me if you want me to go a different way or explain something in a little more detail. Because y'all, sometimes my banker brain is like, whoo, I can keep coming, right? But understand that banks are created to lend. Like that just is what it is. We were raised up in a world of borrowing. But I want y'all to think about that like parenting. As parents, can we not only teach our children what we know? And so as a country that only knows how to borrow money, what do they do? They teach their consumers to borrow money. And so it's this whole cycle of you deposit money, we lend it. And then you in turn end up having to borrow something along the lines, right? And so when we talk about uh, banks creating loans, right, lending money to people, I want you to understand that they're essentially just borrowing it from another person who's depositing. That could be your neighbor from down the street. You never know it. And so that is what they're doing. It's our money that goes into a pool that they're lending out. Let's talk about other things that they're doing with money. They're trading it, y'all, in the largest markets of the world. Because what the banks are created to do by nature is use your money to make more money. But... I want us to double back and think about it. Dang, we're not taught to do that. We're taught to go earn some money and give it to the bank to hold it so we could do what we need to do, aka bills most, most of the time. Okay, hold on one second because I know you're going to echo as soon as I unmute myself. So let me put this in perspective real quick because see, what happens is Francis and I, we like up here with this right now because we've been studying in this for a minute and she's been in this industry a lot longer than I have so I want to put something in perspective really quick because we're about to dig even deeper right sound still okay y'all give me a yes if the sound is still okay I'm just double checking it periodically as we go because I get text messages and things like that so I'm gonna look for a yes in the chat on the sound question and I know there's a little bit of a delay if you are watching live if you're watching the replay there absolutely is no delay all right cool we're still good on sound so I want to put this in perspective really quick let's talk about me I realized that one of the things that my mother always told me was Demita save something. Like you gotta just save something. And so what I would do was I would save something. It wouldn't be much, but I would save something. What we did not know, what I was so unfamiliar with was that we needed to do more than just save something. And so what would happen is I would take a little bit of money, just a little bit, cause I didn't know how much something was. I would take a little bit and I'd put it in the bank, just a little and put it in the bank. And I later learned that that's not what wealthier people were teaching their children. I didn't understand that. True story, facts. I don't know about you. I didn't come from a wealthy family, all right? So when I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, subtitle, what rich people teach their children that the poor and the middle class do not, I knew they were learning something completely different on the other side of the tracks. Well, one of those things that 
I learned that they weren't taught was to save something, right? When I would put that something in the bank, what I didn't know was what Francis is talking about, how they were using that. See, one of the things that we got to understand from the very beginning is money is supposed to move. And so when you sit your money in a bank, guess what happens? You don't make anything on it. And so when I take a thousand dollars, because the average person doesn't have a thousand dollars in their bank account when i take a thousand and i sit it in the bank just our credit union my husband and i just our credit union we actually get paid like one and a half percent and i know that's like rich compared to a lot of banks you don't get a percent not one but do you know what that means that means that i could leave that one thousand dollars there all year just because my mom taught me to save something and i would make a whopping are you ready $15 on it by the end of the year if I didn't move it and take anything out. $15. But what the bank has made on that money, oh my God. And that is what Francis is talking about. They trade it. First of all, if I put a thousand there, they can create an additional 9,000. That y'all comes from this. And things have changed and gotten a little bit worse. But there's this book. And the book, if you want to dig more into this, the book is called Creature from Jekyll Island. And I'm not going to lie to you, it's a heavy read. But if you want to get more into this and understand that this is bigger, they make money difficult to understand because you won't take time to really educate yourself on it. And when you don't, guess what that means? They can make a lot more money off of you. So they create this additional $9,000. So they turn my $1,000 into $10,000, like magically poof, you know, Fugazi, Fugazi, like what does he say? <laughs> it's a Fugazi, it's a Fugazi. Like if you ever seen Wolf of Wall Street, like what is real, what is real, it's not real. And they create this extra money and they make money off that extra money doing exactly what Francis says, lending it out in the form of what? Car loans, in the form of what? Mortgages, in the form of what? Fake PPP loans that some of y'all out here trying to qualify for, in the form of what? Small business loans, in the form of what? Credit cards, in the form of all these loans, home equity lines of credit. They lend out all this money. They charge interest on it. So they make money on money that did not even exist. And then on top of that, as Francis was saying, they put it in the foreign exchange market in Forex. And I earned $15 if I left it there for the year. That's what we want to educate y'all about. The fact that the bank is really making money hand over fist, but it's not just that. Most people don't have a thousand dollars in the bank, Francis. Not only do they not have a thousand, they got negative money in the bank. So now the question, how we get there, how we even get there. That's what I really want you to dig into. Cause I know that's where people are struggling. Like they get their check. It's supposed to be there on Friday. They get it a few days early. It's already gone. Sis, I want you to really get into that. I, I, I hate that I interrupted you. So please pick up where you were. But I really want to get them into where a lot of people are struggling right now. Because we got to serve them where they are. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. We're good. So, man, I love that. Because a lot of times, once you start to study something, it'll never look the same to you. So sometimes we're having a conversation. We have to double back. Like, hold on. Let me talk to the 2005 me real quick. <laughs> But it makes so much sense, y'all, because I've been there. I've been that 18 year old broke college student with a gang of student loans trying to make it while working full time, going to college full time. I'm familiar with overdraft fees. OK, so I, I want to touch on one last thing in the lending sector and then we're going to move on from that, because honestly, fees are, are going to be really where the majority of people are getting caught up. Right. We know a lot of people, the majority of people have debt. That's not a question. But the fees is really how the cycles of needing to go find more money even start to happen. So maybe you listen to all that and you said, well, how? OK, if the bank is borrowing from my money when I deposit it, how is my money essentially in two places at one time? Great question. So if we can keep getting curious like that, we'll start to realize, man, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that I don't really know about. Because to Demita's point, go get that read. They even have um, an audio version on YouTube that you can go find. I'll, I'll try to drop it in this uh, in the chat here, too, along with the book. Because if we start to ask ourselves questions like that, man, how can my money be in two places at one time? It, it can't physically, technically be. 
But see, when they have control of everything, the only thing I have to worry about is perception of us is our reality, right? And so we have to start getting curious because, yeah, no, your money shouldn't be in two places at one time. But when they have things like, oh, you only have to have this much on reserve to be able to do your everyday transactions at the bank, you're good. We got to follow news too, you guys, because now, like Demita said, rules have changed. They're allowed to essentially uh, double up on whatever you put in the bank. The dollar amount doesn't even matter. So yes, you on the line with $50 to your name, they're growing your money too. And so if you're on here and you're like, man, this conversation might not be for me. I don't really have a lot of money. Congratulations. If you have at least a dollar in the bank or if you're negative, this conversation definitely applies to you. So now let's talk about how do we even get stuck in this cycle of fees? Well, first, we got to understand that the bank is making fees uh, a variety of different ways. Right. So we got to think about this. They have requirements to abide by. Right. Because. We ain't going to talk about the Federal Reserve on here today, but go look up who the Federal Reserve is. It's not a fancy building where all the money's at, like a lot of us think. It's a group. That's all I'm going to say on here for lack of getting uh, any deeper into that rabbit hole. But just get curious. I saw a comment on here that came up and said we got to start asking the right questions. Absolutely. Because when we don't ask questions, we're not curious enough, which means we're not caring enough in the moment about what we're going through. And we have to get curious, you guys. So let's talk about these fees, y'all. Demita made a great point. And I kind of chuckled inside a little bit when she said, you know, not, not the fact that she paid a fee, but when she said $25. Because now let's address banks and their overdraft fees. And then I'll walk you through how we even get into being there. Okay, wait, 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 y'all understand. Wait, 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 wait. Y'all got to hear this part. Like, get close to the computer. Get real close, okay? Because this is where I know a lot of people struggling. This right here, this right here is worth the entire time for this live. And I don't want y'all to miss this. I want to remember we're hearing and listening to somebody that worked in a bank, in the banking industry. This is not what she heard. This is not what she thinks happens. This is what she knows from being a professional in the banking industry. All right, go ahead. All right, thank you, Demita. Yeah, look, I'm gonna be getting close too because I get excited when I talk about this part because I've been the person on the other side trying to get out of that cycle. So if you're on here and you're like, I'm familiar with that, but I don't even know how to even begin getting out, I have one huge piece of advice for you. Not financial advice, but kind of financial advice. Start learning what's really happening with your money. Second, start understanding the bank that you bank with because we might have to switch some things up. And third, lean in close. So now let's talk about this. Demita said one key thing, right? We're taught to just go out and earn money, right? If you were raised anything like I was, if you're struggling financially, go out and get a second job. We're only human, you guys. Two and three jobs is for two and three people, but that's what we're taught. So here's what happens. We end up in this cycle of making just enough but then we're never taught how to manage our money. So then we get into adulthood, right? And you're given $60,000, $70,000 of student loans. They know you can't pay back because you didn't even have a job when you applied for them. But then you graduate, you're trying to look for a job. Maybe you can't find one right away. Maybe they're just not paying what you thought they were going to be paying. And so now you have these real adult bills. But here's the thing. Nobody ever taught you how to actually manage money. Like she said, rich dad, poor dad, the things that the wealthy people teach their children that poor and middle class do not. I come from a very poor household, Puerto Rican, Dominican from the Bronx, New York, single mom, four of us and one of her. Listen, she did the best that she could. But teaching us sitting down, this is how we manage money was not a conversation in our house. It was kind of like mental health, you know, the taboo conversations. And so that breeds a whole lot of adults who don't even know how to manage their monthly bills on a monthly basis. So then here's where I. I really hate to use the word predatory because I would think that their intentions are better for us. But being on the inside, I know that it really is predatory. Overdraft fees. I want to start here because that cycle of people not knowing how to manage their money breeds people in overdraft cycles. They go hand in hand because as financial institutions, and this is just my opinion, don't shoot the messenger. I feel like, OK, instead of charging people overdraft fees, why don't you guys host a class a couple of times a month to teach people how to manage money? Oh, wait, because that would in turn make them better, which leaves us. 
her. I think we lost her. She'll be back, y'all. She'll be back. So forgive me for that. It looks like we had a little bit of a glip, a glitch. So when she comes back, we'll dig back into the overdraft situation. And yes, it's absolutely predatory, Tanisha. What I want you guys to do is make sure that you are putting your questions in the chat. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat. She'll be back, okay? She will definitely be back. So in the meantime, um, what is it that I can share when it comes to this? She's the professional, y'all. So what is it that I can share? When it comes to this entire banking industry, let me tell you some of the things that just shocked me um, when it came to this. We have her back. We have her back. Hold on. We're getting our sound back. Can you guys, you guys hear me? We got you. Let's go, baby. Pick up where you left off. It's Let's all the the they they it it so that breeds more people in overdraft cycles because people don't know how to manage the little bit of money that is coming in, which we think it's a little bit, but if managed right, you guys would, would be like, man, I don't, I'm not doing that bad, but we're not taught those things. So now let's talk about why overdraft fees are predatory. Here's why you guys, I want you to think about this because this number blew my socks off. Uh, let's talk about this pandemic. Yes. We've been in a pandemic for two years or however long we've been here. But for financial institutions to make $30 billion in overdraft fees during a global pandemic screams predatory to me. Here's why. Most of those people are unemployed or in poverty. You guys, rich people are not paying overdraft fees. So now let's talk about where the practice comes in where they want to keep people in cycles. And these are just things that I want you guys to start asking yourself like, man, has my bank done that to me? Write, Write it, it down, down if, if it resonates. resonates. Look, real quick. Let me make sure. Somebody says screen's frozen, but it looks like for everybody else, we were doing okay. Y'all let us know. We still good? Yeah, it looks like we're good. I want to make sure. Y'all hear that part that she said? Rich people are not paying overdraft freeze. Y'all hear that? That resonated with me. All right. I think we're good. Keep going. Okay. Awesome. They're not. That's just the truth. Why? Because they're taught how to manage their money. And so... Uh, if you hear any of these things in relation to overdraft fees and maybe they resonate for you, write it down because this is then your homework to go say, I got some questions. Y'all start asking the bank some questions. Sometimes they're not going to have an answer and then they have to make it right. That That's just the crazy banking world we live in. And, and so, so when, when we, we talk, talk about, about fees, fees, are we, are we good? good? We are good. I was going to start with a question that I asked oh, yeah. that I think would actually make this so crazy. Mm -hmm. You guys, so um, this is so interesting. I had this conversation with Francis last week. I called my bank, the bank that I use specifically for business. I called them and said, listen, I don't want anything to go through if I make any errors. If the money is not there, don't push it through. And do you know what they said to me? I said, can you remove this from my account where it will not go through? I don't want to make any errors. They told me they could not do that. They So the, I'm, when we start asking questions, they literally responded to me and said, nope, if you request it, if it's a certain amount, it's going through. So they can hit you with that overdraft fee. So those are some of the questions we need to start asking our bank. So I wanted to start with a real life situation, a real life scenario. Okay, go ahead, sis. Yes, mm -hmm. and feel free, if you guys have had a scenario that you're like, what is this? Drop it in there because even if we can't get to it on here live, I'll get to you in the comments. I get really passionate about this, y'all, because I've been the person in the cycle working for the bank, realizing, oh, hold up, something's wrong. So Demita's example, you guys, by law, every financial institution has to ask you, do you want your account to be opted in or opted out for overdraft fees? You have the right to choose. If you go open a bank account, which stay tuned on Wednesday, you'll, you'll double think this, I promise. But if you do ask that question, if they don't ask you, hey, here's your, you know, overdraft uh would you like to be opted in or opted out if they don't ask you that you ask them like Demita said listen if I don't have money on my car don't let it go through because here's what'll happen they won't ask and then everything is based off of a matrix you ready for your mind to be blown 
So as you're making activity in this account, right, you're making deposits, you're doing your little withdrawals, using your debit card, the evil plastic. I'm going to talk about that in a second. That's how a lot of us get stuck in cycles too. natural evolution of money. Understand that this goes off of what they call a matrix that it just basically means an average, right? Let, let's use basic language an average the median. OK, so if on average my account's bringing in, let's say, two to three thousand dollars monthly. Well, this automated matrix, if you will, that's calculating and watching really it's just an algorithm. Y'all is paying attention to my activity like Facebook. But it's calculating. What is this average? OK, well, if I average bringing the bank two to three thousand dollars they're using on the back end every month. Well, then, hey, we can let her overdraw up to two thousand dollars a month. This is where the cycles start. Because if you're an average person who, again, Demita said this at the beginning, over 70 percent of people do not have a thousand dollars in a savings account. So that makes most people the average person. Nothing wrong with it, but it's the truth. So what they don't tell you is, hey, if you already don't know how to manage your money, but we have this automatic calculation on your account, you could go to CVS the day before your payday. You only had $2 left in your account, but if you use it for $4 because you're human and, and they don't factor in human error, you forget, you swipe that card now, some banks have made it to where there's no, hey, if you overdraw uh, under this amount, we won't charge you a fee. It used to be like that back in the day. It's not anymore. You could literally be overdrawn by $3 right now. They're going to charge you. Most places are a $37 fee. $37.50. Demita said $25. Here's why. That's a credit union. Let me break down fees and why this is also important and why you need to start asking your bank questions. Here's why. You got to think about this, y'all. Banks that have brick and mortar locations are going to charge you more fees. Here's why. We have salaries to pay. We have electricity to keep on. And we have to pay for material that we use on a daily basis, a.k.a. deposit slips, keeping the vault open, you know, paying for brinks to come out to deliver money. There are expenses, which is why Chase is going to charge you thirty seven dollars. But around the way, credit union might charge you twenty two or twenty five. But you multiply that by hundreds and thousands of people. Yeah, they're covering a lot of their costs. So we got to understand this is a money game, y'all, for them. It might not be for you because, sadly, you're the victim on the other end. You didn't know any better when it started, but now you're stuck and you don't really know which way to go. So one thing that I want to point out is maybe you're on here. Maybe overdraft fees is not your problem. You guys, there's ATM fees. There's fees for misusing a credit card. Oh, wow. You didn't even teach people how to use this in the first place. That's pretty predatory to me. <laughs> you see somebody is brand new opening a credit card and you don't explain to them how to use it. Like, yeah, I understand some of that should come from family and whatever the case is. But then you wonder why you have people that are in these constant cycles. But then you start implementing more predatory. I see the fees. Wells Fargo, $35. Yes, they have brick and mortars. And then $37. And then you wonder why the banks like your online banks like Chime could do things like, hey, you can overdraft up to $60 and we'll charge you no fees. Oh, because we don't have buildings to upkeep. We don't really have that many salaries to pay for. Everything you do is on a mobile app. You guys, this is a natural evolution of money. And so when you don't start asking these questions, they throw you from, hey, keep track of your transactions yourself to, whoa, hey, you got this debit card. Now it got a chip in it. Insert it wherever you go. But the whole time, what happens to what happened to the mandatory balance for the account? I, can you elaborate on that question? Um, While he's so, elaborating, can I give you a real life example? I know I had oh, shared, yeah. shared this. Jean-Christophe said for him, it's actually a $35 fee. That's amazing. Okay. So real life example. Thank you. April said, this is excellent information. Thank you, April. Real life example. A friend of mine, she was saying that she thinks she scarred her daughter for life because at one point she went to the bank to withdraw money from the bank and knew that her, um, knew that her check had gotten deposited because she had direct deposit. And somehow when she went to withdraw money from the bank, 
she was in the negative and she could not figure out how are, how am I in the negative when I just got paid? What ended up happening, and I definitely, I know some people can relate. I remember being at a bank that I, after, I never banked with them before when they double charged me. I was like, never, because I know this makes sense. And so I remember, well, I'll use her example because it's actually a lot more dramatic. Her car note came out somehow or another. I don't remember the details. Her car note hit her account twice. It was removed the second time, but by the time it hit that second, by the time they removed it, she had other bills that came out. Those other bills that hit her account because her account went negative when her car note hit the second time, they charged overdraft fees on all of those, but then took the car note out the second payment, but she was still in the negative from when it happened and they did not fix it. I don't know if she knew or I don't know if she tried to get them to fix it. I'm not sure. But I know when something similar happened to me, I talked to the branch manager. This was years ago, by the way, for me. I talked to the branch manager. I had so many, con I literally was like, okay, so you're trying to tell me that when this account hit this the second time, it put my account in the negative. And so these next three charges, I got overdraft fees on them, but I really don't have an overdraft because this shouldn't have hit my account the second time. And then I was like, I can't talk to you. I need to talk to the branch manager. I had a conversation with the branch manager. They still didn't change it. Now, this was probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. But there are people who are still struggling with this very same thing. And it makes, and that's how people get stuck in that cycle. Real life example. Man. Okay, so that is so good because people are still struggling with that. And here's why. A lot of times I feel so bad for the personal bankers that you walk in and go talk to. Because really, y'all, their hands are tied in that computer. After a certain amount, they can't do anything at the branch. And I know because I've been a retail banker before. I've been the person behind the teller line at the desk in the office. And a lot of times, this, this is that whole matrix system, system automated business. Okay, because it's a business. Let's call it what it is. That their hands are really tied. And so I told Demita, like for her example, you guys, almost every single U.S., I can't tell you about overseas, every bank is going to operate different. But for the most part in the U.S., every financial institution is doing one waived fee at least every 12 rolling months. So that whole we can't, first of all, they can give the feedback. Second of all, I do by law have a choice whether or not I want you to process transactions for money that I may not have in my account at the moment you decide to process them. And so that issue right there has been an issue for decades. This whole you post things to people's account in the order that it didn't happen. That's been a big issue, which is why potentially her daughter was kind of like, hold up. Other bills were supposed to come out. But before this second payment might have came out. But here's the thing, you guys, they don't take the time to educate people. That whole opt in, opt out situation, as light as it seems, y'all need to pay attention because now what banks have done is they've split them up. What they don't tell you is in that fine print. Now it says, hey, do you want to opt in and out from your debit card only? Right. Like when I use my card, if I don't have enough. But if I have an auto debit that comes out, oh, yeah, go ahead and let it go through. No, they make you choose in different sections now. So if you have online banking, you can literally go log in, go to overdraft preferences, and you can see that there's different sections now where I can opt in or out for my debit card. And opt in just means if I don't have the money, pay it, and I'll pay you whatever fees. That's dangerous territory, y'all. I know it might make sense because little Johnny might get sick on a Thursday night and he don't get paid till Friday. I get it. But that's why community is also important. We got to normalize, hey, sis, I'm really just struggling. You know. This is my situation. Get around some people that care about you. Because I care enough about people in my circle that if somebody hit me up and says, sis, I'm short $20, literally, I get paid tomorrow. You know I'm about my word because, honestly, do you keep people in your circle that are not about their word? No, so I don't have to worry about stuff like that. But let's normalize doing more of that than putting somebody in a situation where now they already don't have enough money. But they're going to pay the bank $37. Oh, because you did me a favor. No, you put me into more poverty is what you did. And so we we have to ask these kind of questions. It is a setup. It's an okie doke in my language, right? <laughs> and so, so I want you guys to pay attention to this kind of stuff because that is what happens. So back to my point, for decades, the banks would post things in their order. I'll just use that lightly, in their order. 
right? And then it became a problem because I might have used my card at CVS before I anticipated something else coming out, or I had some money for something bigger to come out, and then some small things came out. Now I'm paying $37 fees for $12 transactions. That's predatory, if you ask me. And so these are things that we got to start paying attention to. The whole, if I have a savings account and I don't have enough money in it, I'm getting charged a fee. That's predatory. How are you trying to encourage somebody to save money, but then because they haven't saved a certain amount, I'm going to charge you a fee? Y'all, we got to ask real questions because there are options now because of the evolution of our money that make you question like, this can't possibly be right. No, it's not. <laughs> and so I'm glad that you're asking because what we need to do is ask more of those questions. So in total, y'all, out of, and this is a 2019 number, they're still calculating 2020, how ironic. Oh yeah, because there was a global pandemic. So we got to really figure out what the numbers were. But for 2019, out of $230 billion that the, brought, that the banks brought in, I'll just use those air quotes, that the money that they brought in, over 11 billion of that was in overdraft fees. There's something wrong with that number. Say that one more so time. Out, out of 230 200. billion in the US, I can't speak for overseas, but in the US, 11 billion of that was overdraft fees. Something's wrong with that number. And, and then even further, I don't want to make this a conversation about what I look like or about, about what anybody on the other end of this looks like, but I got to be real honest. Those fees are not being paid by some of the people that look like, I mean, those fees are being paid by a lot of the people that look like me because they're not taught to know money. They're not taught how to use it. They're not taught that, yes, who, oh, as of March, the bank is allowed to use and lend out 100% of whatever you put in that bank. They're not taught things like that, which is why you need to start getting around a, a different conversation because for me, and I'll just speak for me, when I was stuck in that cycle, you guys, the bank started getting creative. Like, how do you get creative to put people in worse financial positions? I don't get it. I really, uh, it, it saddens me because now I'm like, man, I'm, I'm not knocking anybody who's in banking on here. But a, a part of you has to feel a kind of way when you're putting people in bad financial positions. Not because you want to, but because it's part of your job. We also got to normalize squeezing out some of these gifts, y'all, because that's a hard position to be in. To work at a financial institution, see, <laughs> listen, y'all, somebody overdrew 37 cents. You guys, it's a money game. A lot of banks used to have this rule where, hey, there's a $5 threshold. So if you're overdrawing anything less than $5, like you're negative $4.30, you're good. We won't charge you a fee. They did away with that. Why would you do that? Why would you charge somebody $37 on 30 cents or whatever the number was? It's predatory, you guys. So when they need to make up for something, they make up by taking from people who already are not educated. They're not taking from private wealth clients that are getting 12% on their money. And that's, I'm, I'm, I'm really exaggerating. That's a huge number right now. <laughs> Nobody's getting 12%, but it sounded good. Cause you know, private wealth means a million dollars or more. So it kind of sounded good. So I got to clown a little bit on a heavy topic, but seriously, you guys, we, we got to ask these questions and, and it just, it saddens me because I've been the person on the other side of that. And then being stuck in a cycle, they just try to get creative with trying to get you out the cycle, but really they just put you in another one. So some banks have even done things like, Hey, We'll give you an advance on your direct deposit. You can get it two to three days before you even get paid. That's an okie doke too. You want to know why? Because we're sold the topic of, oh, banking is convenient. Let me make your life so financially convenient. When really that's the setup. Because you're targeting people. Think about this. If somebody's wealthy and in a decent financial position, do you think they care if they get access to their direct deposit three days before it hits their account? No, they don't care. They're going to access it when it's there. But somebody who's in poverty, living paycheck to Monday, like one of our mentors says, or paycheck to paycheck, they care if they can access that money two to three days in advance because it matters to them. But you already are targeting someone who already doesn't know about how to manage the money they are already making. That's predatory to me. Somebody might have a different opinion, but that's predatory. You're targeting someone who already doesn't know how to wait till Friday to be able to handle their, their livelihood. 
y'all, that's that's not. It might sound it might convenient, sound convenient, but it's, but it's not. I think it's really important to point out here that um, it's really important to understand that if you use banking, like if you just, I don't, I almost don't want to say the right way, because <laughs> yeah, but if you use it the right way. The right way by meaning you get your check deposited, you pay your bills, you don't over you don't overdraw, you only use what you have. The bank can't they can't charge you these exorbitant fees, which there are people right now, there are some of you guys that are watching right now, and you don't even qualify for a credit card. And so you think that you're not paying any interest. Can I tell you that the interest that you're paying is hey, technology, what can you say? So you feel like you can't even qualify for a credit card. There are some of you guys that cannot qualify for a credit card. And if you could, the interest would be like 26% on a credit card. But do you realize that you're, the, the amount of interest that you're paying is just not called interest? It's called fees? There are fees. They are three dollars money out of the ATM because the ATM part of the network at your bank. All that stuff's to add up. Essentially and significantly, so if we use, um, and we're going to introduce a completely different way to actually use banking that is revolutionary. But the first thing that we want you to understand is that the banking today is broken. It's completely broken. And so I just really want to share that piece just a little bit because the interest is there. It's there. You may not qualify for a credit card. But they getting it from you. They getting it. We got a little bit more time left. And I know we went fast, y'all. This hour went quick. It went really, really fast. Please, what is something that you would like for us to know before we have to close and get out of here? What do you what do you want to sh want to share? Um, honestly, don't uh just don't be afraid to ask for help, y'all. Like, I know sometimes it seems like, man, I'm so far into whatever the situation is. But like Demita said, you're already paying interest. They're just calling it something different. And so we have to normalize going into conversations and into rooms and saying, I don't really know a lot about this, but I know that the way I'm currently doing it is not working for me. And for me, you guys, that was the honest conversation that I had to have at 19 years old, like, the way I'm doing money is not working for me. If it worked for me, I wouldn't have to be hoping that on Thursday I have enough gas to make it to, to the gas station Friday morning. You know, when you drive in there on the Lord's Prayer, like, <laughs> and you pull up at the pump and you, you put it in park, but you're wondering, like, dang, was that, did I put it in park or did it cut off? Because there might not be gas in here. I remember those days, but it took for me to sit with people that I worked with at the time for them to break down like, OK, I was a college student before. I also didn't know about money. And now that I've learned something, here's a couple nuggets. And, and so be OK with saying I don't really know that part of the conversation or I think I know some of the conversation, but it's not working because the way you know it's not working is if any part of this conversation kind of felt uncomfortable maybe you felt like dang that's me or that was me or that's kind of still me or that's me but in a different version <laughs> any kind of version of that then there's part of this conversation that that maybe you could get better at and so just normalize that being okay saying hey listen I don't really understand part of this conversation but I'm willing to stay around it because the way I'm doing money is just not working and for a long time you guys the way I did money wasn't working I wasn't taught how to do money the right way. And then, you know, so as you go learning, you'll be like, okay, it's going to take you getting uncomfortable, but I have a better question for you. Would you rather stay in the comfort of you're paying everyone else the money you work so hard for, or is it time to get a little uncomfortable and, and be okay with changing some habits up so that you can get to decide what you do with the majority, if not all of your money? Because you should. You should be the steward of whatever you work for, your business brings in, however you're earning money, producing income. You should dictate where all that money goes. Not, hey, it's hitting the bank on Friday, but, you know, 30% of that might be going into a negative balance or automatically transferred back to a credit card because they have my credit card hooked up to my checking account as overdraft protection. I mean, there are things that we have to just start asking more about. So if I could give you one nugget, y'all, it's just normalize asking questions. 
you heard something on here that you really didn't understand, but you know it's part of your situation. You guys, I'm an open book. I feel like part of the reason I spent 13 years in, in financial services in general was one for me to learn. I got to be honest. I'm not an exception to the rules here. I had a lot to learn. I'm still learning a lot. But I was okay with asking those people questions like, what does that mean? What does this mean? Okay, that's not my situation, but I want that to be my situation. And so if there was something that you heard on here, you guys, get back with the person that shared this live with you, tied you, and let them know. They can put us in a Facebook message. I have no problem answering questions for you. Because while I'm not here to give you financial advice, I do want to see you doing better financially. And so... Demita, Demita, if you have, if you any, have other any other questions, questions if anybody, if anybody in the chat, in the chat I can't see the chat. So if they have so questions, they have I'm, questions happy, to I'm happy to answer. I would love if they could ask questions, but I we are out of time because okay, in five okay. minutes, I got to open up a Zoom. However, <laughs> okay. what I do want to do is this, y'all. We can continue this conversation. Um, I don't know. Maybe we'll be able to get Francis back because there's so much more into this whole banking thing that we did not even get to touch on today. So we've talked about possibly doing some type of limited series but this is what i want to also share if i could leave i may not be the banking professional but let me tell you what i am i am a i've been in all kinds of bad money situations professional all right so what my i, I like to be transparent because i know in transparency and in being authentic my true self and sharing my truth and my story it helps somebody because there are other people who things look similar my husband and i together y'all we did earn six figures in our household but you could not tell by our bank account. Tell me how do you have, and we didn't have a six figure lifestyle. I can tell you that much, right? What in the world was happening? So this is the reason that I want to point this out. There is a way that money works. Money is a horrible master, but it's a real good servant. And so the question is, how do I get money to serve me instead of me listening to my money just going all over the place. See, when you don't know where your money is going, your money is your master and you don't realize it. It's working you because you have no clue where it's going. It's going in your wallet and right out, in your account and right out. And because as Francis said, that debit card, it takes away that feel of money. And so you become numb and you don't track it as well. You know why? Because if you took a thousand dollars out of your pocket right now and you laid out $50 bill after $50 bill until you got to a thousand at the store where you were getting your newest big screen electronic toy, it feels a lot different than slapping down a, a debit card, sliding it in a machine. It don't feel the same. They don't weigh the same. And so we become numb to it. Very, very numb. And so I just want to encourage you on Wednesday, we're furthering this conversation. We are not done because we don't just come to you with problems. We come to you with solutions. A lot of us have done something which sounds fancy. It sounds it's called being unbanked. What does that even mean? I understand it's confusing. What if you could BYOB, be your own bank? You can. You can. And that's what we're going to share with you because I have the one and only an incredible cryptocurrency expert who is going to walk us through exactly what that looks like. So make sure you tune in again on Wednesday. Prayerfully, we will have no audio visual issues. But if we do, listen, technology is technology. Don't you let that stop you from getting this game and getting this information. You better quit playing. It's not always going to be convenient, but it is going to be worth it. Francis, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Demita. Demita. So grateful for you. We got to come back and do this again. We're going to talk about that limited series so y'all can benefit from that. Love you, sis. Good thank night, you. Good night, y'all.